One of the trickiest yet essential skills for A-level biology students is critical analysis. And coming up in today's episode, I'm gonna be breaking down how to teach the skill of critical analysis. I'll explain how to approach these questions and how your students can maximize their marks. Plus there'll be a quick win to save you planning time. So stick around to learn how to teach critical analysis effectively and get your students exam ready. Hey there teachers, welcome to Miss Estrick Teach and Tell, the podcast where every week I dive into all the tips and tricks that make teaching life so much easier. Whether you're a veteran educator, an early career teacher, learning the ropes or balancing the classroom with being a busy parent, this will help you streamline your workload and bring a bit more balance to your life. You bring the coffee and I'll bring the teach and tell. Hey everyone and welcome back to Miss Estrick Teach and Tell, the podcast that helps you teach smarter, not harder. The podcast that helps busy teachers streamline their workload and feel more confident in the delivery of their lessons. I'm Katie Estrick and this is your go-to place for teaching tips, workload strategies and everything in between. But before we get into teaching critical analysis, let's have a quick coffee catch up. First of all, I hope you like my uh, biology mug and you can appreciate it, my selfie mug. Uh, this was actually, I think it was a Valentine's Day present that I got maybe last year, but I've had many a biology themed mug over the years. I feel I should clarify, a Valentine's Day present from my boyfriend, not from a student. And then I've also had many biology themed mugs from students in the past. So I do have a cupboard full of biology pun mugs, which I absolutely love. But anyway, how has this week been? I have been ridiculously busy because I said yes to taking on another project. So I've actually done some work in the past with Cambridge University Press with their international A-level writing one of the books, which has now finally been published. And they have asked me to do a few little projects along the way as well. They've asked me to contribute towards the IGCSE um, new book that they've got coming out, which is all to do with questioning. And in the past, I've said no to things because I just realized my workload is so busy already and it's leading up to exam season but I thought oh do you know what it's only however many questions it is that I need to write it'll take up some time in February and March I can do this no problem guess what February has arrived and now I'm here thinking what on earth was I thinking where is this time coming from so it's been ridiculously busy squeezing all of that in but it is something I do love to do it's really interesting to see how a professional publisher goes about planning planning how they create resources and their guidelines. So it helps me then when I come to create all of my resources to think, well, what have they done? I can implement some of the things where I prefer this sort of strategy. So it's all great learning experience. Anyway, let's go on to today's main content. We're diving into critical analysis, which is a key skill because it makes up 15 marks on the AQA A-Level Biology Paper 3, which you can actually see here if you're watching on YouTube. On the spec at a glance, it does say, 15 marks on paper three for A-level AQA biology will be critical analysis. Now they do also come up in some of the other papers, but you're guaranteed 15 marks will be critical analysis. And these critical analysis style questions can be daunting for students. And they're often big discriminator questions because the top students are getting top marks. And then most other students are getting mid to low marks on them. So if your students can master these, that could put them at an advantage of gaining between five to 10 extra marks compared to other students on these 15 marks, which can be the difference between a grade. So let's break it down. First of all, I always like to start by explaining to my students, what do we actually mean by critical analysis? Because they might not have a clue what you mean when you're saying critical analysis questions. So I would show them an example. It's the questions where there is a method and sometimes a data. And it always says scientists were investigating dot, 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 dot it tells you what they're investigating. Usually it gives you a bit of information about the method and then you usually get the data as well. And there'll be a series of questions linked to maybe um, smaller elements of the practical or the data analysis. There might be some maths questions. You might have to do some application explaining results. But the key critical analysis parts are where it says evaluate and it could be evaluate the method, evaluate the data, or they might say a student or a scientist came to this conclusion conclusion, do you agree? But what all of those have in common are you are having to look or the students are having to look at the method and the data and picking out anything that would support the conclusion, but also 
picking out anything that would make you question the validity of the conclusion. So that's my start point, is I always tell them that is what we mean by a critical analysis question. And they normally know exactly what I mean once I've gone through it, and if you show an example as well. So what is critical analysis then? We've gone through what the question is, but I would then start to tell the students what is it in a bit more detail, not just what is that type of question. So I'd point out to them that it's not just about looking at the results and coming to a conclusion or having a description. It's not just having an agreement or a disagreement. It's digging deeper. So you have to look at the method, look at the data and the conclusion and what they were investigating. And that is then your starting point to starting to evaluate it critically. Now to help them do this, I will model with them. I've had a visualizer, so I'd actually model how I would read the question as I went. And the way that I would read these questions is with a highlighter, love a highlighter, which you are allowed to use in the exam. You can highlight the questions. You just cannot highlight your answer. So I would have a highlighter in the exam if your exams officer lets you do that. If not, they can just underline. But highlight, and as I read through it, I show them what I'd be highlighting. And the things that I'd be highlighting are what are they investigating? What is the independent variable? What are they measuring? So the dependent variable. Any control variables that they specify. And then anything that jumps out to me that is either a good part of the method, so it helped to make you get valid results, or anything that is a bad part of the method. So then that would mean you won't necessarily get valid results. So the sorts of things might be, if they've specified a sample size, I'd be highlighting that because either the sample size is going to be large or it's not. If they've specified a duration of time they did the investigation for, I'd be highlighting that because there's often a mark if they've said we've done it for two weeks, that's not a long enough amount of time to see long-term effects. If they've talked about a control experiment, a big one is if they've tested something on animals and the conclusion is about humans or if they say we've tested this on spinach but the conclusion is about plants so saying that well it's on spinach spinach isn't going to behave the same way as every single plant or whatever it might be. So those are start points. I get them to watch me highlight and I tell them why I'm highlighting everything. I sometimes actually annotate it. So they've got one version in their notes of an exam question highlighted with annotations. So they can see what is my thought process and that's what you should be doing in the exam. Now that will take me at least five to 10 minutes to do when I'm doing it under the visualizer and talking them through each step. And sometimes then they get alarmed thinking, this is a five mark question or a four mark question. And we just spent five to 10 minutes reading the question. We haven't even answered anything yet. That's way too long. So I do point out to them at this point, I am deliberately doing this slowly because it's the first time and we're really thinking about it. I do want you to approach the questions or to practice going at the questions like this. And it will take you a long time at the start, but the more you do this, you get quicker and it becomes second nature. And I'd say to them, I took five to 10 minutes to do that, but I could have done that in one minute because I've done this so many times, but it's about practicing this technique. So then once we've done that, and if you do have data, this is where I then go on to the describe, conclude and evaluate. And I actually have this within my critical analysis lesson that I do it as a I don't know what you'd call it, like a template or a map. We could just do it as boxes where I'd show them some data. And step one, I usually get them to sit on the whiteboard or they could write around it in the describe box. And I ask them to look at the data and to identify key patterns. So I might phrase it to them as, what is the obvious pattern? So is it a correlation? And if it is, is it negative? Is it positive? Is it strong? Is it weak? Or is it a difference between means? Is it a difference between values? Is it frequencies? Whatever it is, step one is, I want you to just identify what is the key pattern. But then in your description stage, I also want you to pick out anything that doesn't fit the pattern. So are there any outliers? Are there any anomalies? If you have got a scatter graph, do you see any points where you've got overlaps? That sort of thing. Or if you do have standard deviations, I'd be commenting on that. And as well, point out if there's a log scale. It's always a mark for talking about the log scale, because if there is a log scale, that means there's a large range of results. Another key thing to look for if you're describing the results is to look at, does your value ever go down to zero? Because if you're looking at the effectiveness of a drug, maybe, and this drug has to kill bacteria, if the number of bacteria present never drops to zero, zero, that's going to be a relevant point to raise. So that's my step one. Once we've had a look at the method in detail, we're then describing the key points. And again, I take quite a long time doing this with them. I like them to have a go in pairs first of all. They can pick
pick out the obvious patterns and then anything else. What we then do next is look at that data and think, what conclusion could we come to? Now that bit is only really relevant if the question doesn't have a conclusion provided to you. But even if it does, it could be worth them to consider based on this data, what can I conclude? So for example, if there was a significant increase in mean species richness in certain habitats, we might conclude that there was a change in that habitat over time. So that would be step two is conclusion. That bit doesn't tend to take too long. Then the next step is the evaluate. And this is where, again, if they've got the highlighters, get the highlighters out because I tell them to go back to their description step and highlight in one color all the things that they pointed out that would support the conclusion. And then in another color, all the things that they described that do not support the conclusion. And this is now just basing it on the data. So at this point, I would then say, we've now done two different things. We have looked through the method. And again, they could actually highlight that in two different colors for what does support and what doesn't support getting valid data. And we've evaluated the method as we were reading through. And now we've evaluated the data Data as we're reading through. That in itself can take an entire hour and then, or maybe just under, and then you have a little bit of time to then show them the evaluate style exam question and then have a go. But that's how I would approach it just to teach them, this is how you critically analyze. This is what you should be looking for. And now we can pull all of that into our answer. Now to try and help them with this as well, I would point out that you are allowed to bullet point your answers for AQA. You could even present this as a table. So if they're gonna find it helpful, they can you always have one column of supports conclusion, one column doesn't support the conclusion. For A-level, you don't then have to come to an overall conclusion at the end unless the question explicitly says and give your own judgment or give your own conclusion. And if it's a five mark question, I'd be suggesting them to try and have a balance, but you don't always have a balance, but you should always have at least one in both columns. Because if you don't, you're probably not gonna get over half marks for that question. So some common pitfalls and mistakes students make to point out to them to and make sure that they don't make them. Number one, read the question carefully. If they're being asked to evaluate, is it the method? Is it the data or was it all of it? Or if you are asked to say, do you agree with the conclusion? Look for what else they say, because often they say, use all the information in this question, which again means some of the marks are going to come from evaluating the method. Some will come from evaluating the conclusion. Next is if there is a statistic included and it does or doesn't show a significant difference, that is what they have to say. This is something that AQA picked up on that lots of students are really good at saying, oh, well, it's really good because they include a statistic statistic. But what they don't necessarily then go on to say is this means there was a significant, so they have to use that word significant, and they have to state the pattern. So was it a significant difference or was it a significant correlation? And if it wasn't significant, then you'd say the reverse of that. Another interesting point, or at least it was interesting to me, that came up in the examiner's feedback this year was that students are talking about points that aren't mentioned. So let's say you had that whole method and it told you that they had a mean result, which in itself implies there must have been repeats. But students, if they haven't mentioned the sample size or the number of repeats, if they were then to say, well, a downside is they took a small sample. Well, we actually don't know that because we know they have done repeats because they've got a mean, but we don't know if it's small or not. So you can't assume it was small just because they haven't mentioned it. And this was a point that AQA raised that if it's not mentioned in the method and it's a scientist or a group of scientists who have conducted conducted the experiment, students are to assume that they have conducted it properly because they are trained scientists. So if it's not mentioned, don't mention it in your answer, basically. So you should only be mentioning things that are there in the method that look good or don't look good. The one exception of that is if you have come to a conclusion and they haven't done a statistic because you do have to have a statistic to come to a valid conclusion whether something is significant or not. But anything to do with the method, if it's not mentioned, then they shouldn't mention it and they are to assume that a scientist is competent. It's only if you can see in the method itself, you see they have done something that isn't good enough to get valid results. So once you've gone through with your students how to approach it, so how in the actual exam 
time you should go about doing these questions, but also that strategy of how to answer them when they're revising to improve these skills. The next big thing is going to be practice because they will need to get quicker at it because everything that we went through just there will take a long time, but the more they do it, the quicker they'll get. And it's approximately 1.3 minutes per mark students should spend on questions. Now that is averaged across the whole paper and some questions aren't going to take 1.3 minutes, whereas others like the critical analysis ones, one mark might take a little bit more than that. So, so I'd say if you have got a critical analysis style question, I've just done it on my calculator. Let's say it was a five mark question times 1.3, probably quite embarrassing that I had to do it on the calculator. But anyway, that comes to 6.5, so six and a half minutes. I'd probably round up to seven and say, right, seven minutes, have a go. But I'd only give them seven minutes if I haven't already done the whole reading through part. If you've already thoroughly read through and highlighted with them and it was a five mark question, I'd probably now give them four marks because we've already invested the time together to work out the information. But definitely do some time in lessons where you're saying, right, here's the exam question, you've got this time to do it. So they get used to having to do what you've taught them, but in a timed condition. Now, if you do want your students to have lots of practice of this, I do actually have on my student part of my website of Miss Estrick Biology, a freebie section. And there is a bundle called the Skills Assessment Bundle. One of the packs of questions in that is all critical analysis questions. So you could either download that and use it in your lesson or you could encourage them to do that for homework so they've got a bank of critical analysis questions to now practice what you have taught them so that's already one freebie just to mention but i have got another resource roundup of the week that i wanted to talk to you about which if you are new here every week i give you a resource of some kind for free to help streamline your teaching and just to give you a better work-life balance so you've got that bundle of free questions ready made for you if you want to use that in your lessons or students for homework but i'd also encourage you before you teach and I do recommend you do explicitly teach a critical analysis skills lesson you could direct students to my YouTube video which is teaching students how to answer critical analysis questions and they could watch that before they come to the lesson because then it gives them a great introduction to this skill and then when they arrive to your lesson they've got a bit of an idea already and they'll be more able to engage in it so I will link that in the description below but you can just search Miss Estrick critical Critical analysis and you'll find it. My quick win of the week. So if you are looking to save time, make lesson planning for critical analysis easier, plus all the other skills that are essential for A-level biology, then I highly recommend you check out my A-level skills resource bundle, which if you're watching on YouTube, you can see here what the other skills are. And here's an insight into what the critical analysis lesson contains. But basically there are five lessons covering critical analysis, comprehension, math, statistics, application, and long questions or extended response for A-level biology. So you could take that as revision lessons that you teach, or they could actually be embedded within the learning throughout the year. So you're teaching skills as you go. So I'll link that in the show notes or the YouTube description. But that is it for today. Thank you for listening. And I hope you found this episode helpful and it gives you more confidence in how to teach those critical analysis skills to help your students get those 15 marks on paper three. It is such an important skill for them to master to get higher marks, but also if they want to go on to any kind of science scientific degree or career, it is an essential skill to help them have. If you did find this episode helpful, I would really appreciate it if you could leave a review or a comment because it helps to boost this episode further to reach more teachers just like you. But that is it for today. I'll see you next time. You bring the coffee and I'll bring the teaching tells.